Welcome to the Newbie Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm Jonathan Boyle with my co-host, Joey Chan, and we have a special guest today, Kimberly Kesterkey. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, Kimberly. So Kimberly, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, kind of how you got started in real estate? Yeah, absolutely. So my story is probably not very unique to compared to other investors out there. So back in 2006, I had purchased my first home and I was living in Augusta, Georgia at the time. And at the time, lenders were really loose in their lending practices. They were giving out loans a lot easier compared to how they are today. And so I was able to buy my first property and just thinking that, hey, this is a really great investment. It's just gonna go up and up and up and I'm just gonna be selling it at a profit. Well, two years later, we all know what happened was the 2008 crash and I was 28 years old at the time, and I found two things happened. So my equity went down $30,000 at that point. So I just, you know, obviously didn't want to sell my property at that point. And then the second thing that happened is I was transferred from my job from Augusta, Georgia to Atlanta, Georgia. So basically I had to figure something out because I didn't have $30,000 to take to a closing table being a landlord wasn't necessarily even on my purview at that moment, but I knew I had to do something. And so at that moment, I chose to find some renters and place them in the home. And I moved three and a half hours away to Atlanta. And then I just started managing that property remotely. And over the years, I found that I never had a vacancy on that unit. I found that it was running pretty good that there was a really good rental market in Augusta, Georgia. And so I decided, well, hey, if I'm having success here on this one little property, then what about others that are in that same neighborhood and in that same area? So I started acquiring duplexes. I have a triplex now, and I really started building up a portfolio over those 15 years that now I have 18 units mm -hmm. that I self-manage three and a half hours away, but I still have a full-time job. And I think that a lot of a lot of people, they think, oh, you know, if I'm working full time, I can't necessarily be successful in real estate. Right. Well, you can. I mean, there's definitely ways that when you build the right processes and put the right processes in place that it can be done. So that's really my 15 year story in a nutshell. And feel free to ask questions if you want me to expand on anything. Wow, it's amazing. You didn't like come out the gate intentionally looking to be a landlord. At the end of the day, you know, that's kind of what real estate's all about. Like, you know, eventually getting that financial freedom from it. I guess uh, I just kind of wanted to touch base on one thing you mentioned when you started buying the properties. How did you start financing like the second, the third one and so on and so forth? Sure. So. You know, I I did the very conservative route. I was able to get a couple conventional loans on the first few. And then I started getting more training and going to more real estate courses and learning more about hard money and learning more about private investors and learning more about subject to and ways to acquire properties in a different way. And so I just started experimenting. So I've I've done some deals with hard money. I've done some deals with a subject to and you know i'm working now on doing more on seller financing as well but i just think that with you know the great thing about having a w-2 job for your listeners who still have a w-2 and want to get into real estate is that you can get those conventional loans a lot easier but there are other financing strategies that you can explore and work with all at the same time so it, it opens up a lot of different options yeah yeah, yeah so that that's fantastic that actually that was something i kind of didn't expect you know the the subject to uh because we're we're very much into that but so we're here in northern new jersey and is not as popular here especially subject to the seller finance is probably a little more popular mm -hmm. but subject to for sure it wasn't and and like I said, a lot of buy and hold investors, they don't really get into that as much here in New North Jersey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was like pretty shocked when you, you said, yeah, one of the strategies I use with some <laughs> too. Well, know. it's it's a harder sell to the seller, of mm -hmm. course, because they're gonna want all of their cash up front. 
but there's really good ways to present it to them. You know, some sellers just want to have some cash flow. And when you find those particular sellers that are looking for cash flow and still be able to get something from their asset, then that's when the light bulb starts clicking where they realize, well, this is a good deal. You know, maybe I don't need all the cash up front. I can get cash flow over a series of years. Mm. Definitely. Just uh, out of curiosity, because I know this is kind of what we've done in the past. Do you typically present maybe like two or three different offers to certain people? So that way, you know, it's more of a choice rather than take it or leave it. <laughs> it that's a great strategy. And, you know, initially I didn't because I just didn't have the right training. But I noticed that when I started doing that, it, it, brought down the wall. And I'm sure you guys see that too, because again, now the seller has a choice. Okay. Which, which one do I want to go with and which way do I want to go? And then I also have gotten my real estate license, you know, over the years, just kind of, you know, studied for it. So I have my real estate license more just for me as an investor so that I can have a little bit more freedom when I'm negotiating deals. And I also put that option as, Hey, and if I'm not the right buyer, then I could sell your property for you on the MLS. So it's it's given a lot of different ways that I can create a deal when I am going out and uh, seeking out sellers. That definitely makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I, I know Jonathan's also a real estate agent. So that, that definitely helps him, you know, especially in getting access to properties, access to MLS, you know, things like that. So it, it definitely does help. So when I ask you, you have a, you have a kid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just, just one, right? Just yes. One. Yes. Yep. How do you deal with having a kid, having a career and real estate? Like, how do you juggle all that? That's a great question. And I'm glad that you asked. Some days are easier than others. You know, some days I don't get any tenant requests or maintenance requests. And then other days, it just seems like, yes, there's a lot piling on. But when I look at it as an aggregate of the week or the month, it it's definitely manageable. Now, if I had 100 units, I don't think I would be sitting here saying the same thing. Right. But there, there's options for people. Property Hiring a property manager, that's mm -hmm. one option. I personally haven't done that yet, but I know that as I acquire more, it it's going to happen. It is definitely going to be one of those things that I'm going to have to do to be able to leverage and scale up. You, you could hire a virtual assistant. I'm exploring that. I'm testing that out a little bit. Um, I'm still you know, I wish I had, you know, a great success story to tell you, I'm still trying it out. But what I'm finding is that, it, you know, with the different processes that I've put into place where you know, for work orders and tenant requests and listing properties and so on, you know, it really is as easy as the virtual assistant going into the email that I have set up mm -hmm. and starting to address. Mm -hmm. And she just needs some time to get up and running and trained. Once she knows who to call and what the processes are, I think it's gonna run extremely smoothly. And that's what my goal is. So there's just different ways that investors can delegate and hire on help because you're just, you do have to get some help. You know, with, with my daughter, you know, I get a lot of help from her dad, which is great. And so it all ends up working out. It's just, you gotta be organized and kind of know what's on your plate, what has to get done, who can you delegate to, mm -hmm. and then just start executing. No, that's great. So one of the reasons we, you know, we, we wanted to talk to you was because it seems like you had a really good system mm -hmm. in place, you mm -hmm. know, so, so that you're able to do all these things and kind of not be like overwhelmed, you know, pulling your hair out, right? right? Yes. Yeah. We kind of talked about this earlier. So we'll have the show notes, basically. We'll have the link in the show notes. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll share it with us. Uh, if you can elaborate uh, what I'm kind of talking about, what, sure. what you're sharing, what you're going to be sharing with us. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm offering listeners a rental toolkit, and it's going to give some high-level processes that I've put in place of, number one, how to create a virtual playbook, which – it could be your rental property playbook. It doesn't have to be a virtual playbook, you know, for those that want to manage their properties within a 10 mile radius or across the country, you know, so it's just basically putting together the processes. I'm going to share those. And then also some tips on how to build a team. So, you know, once you have your, your playbook of where you're going to invest, what are your processes? What are they going to look like? Then you've got to build a team. And who are those people on your team? That's going to be your, HVAC contractor, your electrician, that's going to be your plumber, handyman, 
maybe a real estate agent. You know, it just all depends, you know, how how are you going to acquire these deals and then who's going to manage repairs or renovations once you do acquire the deal. And then the third and final thing is, OK, now you've got your property, you've got an asset. How are you going to get a qualified tenant in there? And then the process on how I go ahead and do that. So it's it's a toolkit that gives a very high level overview of all these different things. And but there's a lot of value to it, especially for people who are new and just are kind of looking at, oh, my gosh, I want to do this. But how would I even start? It really helps give a good framework. That's amazing, because like, to be honest, like right now I have well, technically with with uh, the two we just acquired have about 15 units. And to be completely transparent, I'm not the most organized person. And, you know, I know Joey could admit he's not either. <laughs> These tools are actually very necessary. And I know for like Joey and I right now, it's not as crazy, but down the road, you know, we probably have to talk about implementing a lot of systems ourselves. So mm -hmm. for all you listeners, don't be like us be more like Kimberly here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. and, you know, and the processes get learned by getting out there and doing it too. You know, I mean, this is from doing this for 15 years, not always having a process and, you know, having somebody not pay on time. How was I going to handle that? And I've just over the years, now I have a system. Okay. I've got this exact system of day three, this letter is sent day five, this letter is sent X, Y, Z. And luckily, because I've had that system, just as you know, something to say is knock on wood, I haven't had an eviction yet. And I think a lot of it is to is geared towards just being very clear on the front end during the lease signing process and being very clear the first day that rent is late. But there's other processes like managing maintenance requests and other things that I'm yeah. happy to help your listeners with as well. Mm -hmm. um, how have you been uh, dealing with obviously COVID has pretty much freeze all evictions, but how have you been managing that? It, like, have you had any tenants been late and what do you do now? Sure, so let's say that the state of Georgia, you know, operates a little bit differently in terms of, yes, evictions have been halted, but they also opened up essential businesses a lot sooner. So I think that helped. Um, in terms of late payments, there have been a couple that have, that the tenants had come to me and explain their situation and that, yes, I gave a pass and, and worked with them on. A lot of the reasons they were always on you know, tenants that paid on time. And this is just 2020 has just been one of those weird years that hopefully will never happen again. And so, of course, you know, I, I went away from my typical process at that point. And I think, too, when you work with your tenants and they understand that you know, that we see them like, hey, we're all human here. Things happen. I'm willing to work with you. Then you get a better result. Now, there you got to be really, really careful. As you guys know, you got to be so careful, though, because there's that fine line of working with somebody and then somebody taking advantage of it. Luckily, because processes have been in place that that hasn't happened. People have paid their rent on time. You know, a couple people that needed a little bit of an extra, a little extra time. You know, I've I've made the concession. But I also didn't send out a huge letter to everybody at the beginning, like, hey, if you need some concessions, let me know. I waited for the tenant to come to me and then I dealt with it on a case by case basis. Gotcha. Yeah, I think yeah. you need to do that. I had one tenant, he basically reached out to me. He said, hey, you know, I work in the airline industry, you know, I'm, I'm an airline mechanic and, you know, we don't have too much work right now because, you know, there, nobody's really flying too much. So, and he always paid on time prior. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy that he actually reached out to me and he said, hey, you know, they actually changed the way they were going to pay us. You know, he used to get paid weekly. And he told me, hey, you know, now we get paid uh, bi-weekly bi instead of weekly. So can't give you the full amount up front, but I can give you basically half and half. And I said, that's, that's fine. And he said, look, if you have to, you know, you can charge me a late fee. I told, I told him, listen, don't worry about the late fee this time, but you know, don't be late in the future and you know, we're good. But the, the good thing is that, you know, he reached out to me and he's like, you know, I'm so embarrassed to, to even tell you this, you know, I've never been late before anywhere you know any of his prior rentals or anything like that 
So, you know, so I tell them, look, I, I understand because of what's going on in the world right now. So that, that, that made me very, it felt good, you know, yeah. to, to kind of help him. It makes sense. Cause like, for example, one of my tenants at the start of COVID, he lost his job. Like, well, not his job. It was like really his business. Cause like, he was like, he ran like a trucking business, but at the beginning, I guess like, I don't know, he didn't get as much business at that point. So then he was telling me, Hey, can I pay you on a weekly basis? And you know, like he's been like, he pays every month pretty much, but the only issue like is still weekly right now until like COVID, I guess, halts or whatnot. But I, I get what you're saying. You kind of want to work with them because at the end of the day, we're kind of in the service industry, you know, we're tailoring to our uh, tenants and whatnot. Absolutely. And, and also too, again, you know, the whole point is, you know, in all of our stories, the tenants had paid on time at the on front, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And there was a good relationship built there, a good rapport built there. And I think it's really important because, you know, life isn't always linear. You know, things happen and we just have to be able to ebb and flow as well. Have our processes, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, but when things fall out of the equation that are unexpected, be willing to adjust. Exactly. Uh, Kim, just going forward, where do you see yourself headed in the next, uh, you know, like five years or whatnot in real estate? Yeah. So I've really been thinking a lot about this over the past few months because I'm getting up to the amount of units that I'm happy with. So the next five years, I want to do more seller finance deals. And what I, when I say seller finance, the way that I envision it is I want to find properties. It doesn't even matter where they're located, but very inexpensively, 50,000, maybe and below if I can find those. And I know that they're out there, at least in Georgia, there are those out there, oh, yeah. renovate them and then sell them as the bank seller finance and mm -hmm. put in just good terms and be able to sell it to people that may not be able to go and get a conventional loan, but have a good track record of income and a good track record of, you know, decent credit and just be able to start generating cash flow that way because I see that as truly passive because at that point I think it's really neat to be the bank rather than to pay the bank so I'm I'm working on making that shift yeah definitely uh it, it's a it's a good very good strategy uh I did one in Texas more recently and basically I acquired the property subject to I did a little bit of repairs, not too much. All in, I was like twenty five hundred, and and then basically sold it to um, someone that was moving from out of state, so they didn't have the best credit, but it wasn't terrible. It was like six hundred, so it wasn't like it wasn't like four fifty or something like that, yeah. you know. So um, they had the down payment. They put uh, it, it was rather low. It was only ten percent. So he put his ten percent down, and then like I said, sell the finance it to him. So that, that was good. And so obviously we did a mortgage wrap on the existing mortgage was, as well. That's yeah. great. I was just going to ask if yeah. you did the wrap or how you, because that's a great idea. That's a great strategy. Yeah. Um, but actually I, I've, I've spoken to a few uh, real estate investors, more like high level guys. And they actually told me uh, instead of doing what I did, I could have done a lease option. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with lease option. What they told me was, you know, do the lease option. That way you actually don't sell the property, but you're, you're, you're getting a down payment from them. So just the same to buy that option. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of renting it out to them. However, they don't own the property, but they're going to take care of it as if they were buying the property so so it's it's kind of between like a seller finance and a rental mm -hmm. you know it's kind of like in the middle and uh so let's say in between uh depending on your terms right if you do a three years or five years or something in between uh let's say they something happened and they can't actually buy it they can't exercise the option then they basically give the property back to you so now you can do this again but your proper property has probably appreciated most likely within the next five years let's say so you can try to do this again however you still own the property so that that's that's the only good thing about it and also they're they're most likely not going to call you for repairs and things like that in the meantime i like that that's a it's kind of a like hybrid i like that definitely yeah. 
it's, it's a good one. And I think what I was thinking is about the maintenance, but you're right. They're yeah. still taking care of the maintenance and you can write it in your lease option that they're yeah. what they're responsible for. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the landlord or the person holding the note could maybe be responsible for exterior or some of the, the high level things, like yeah. the roof or or maybe not even that. I, I like that. I'm just, I'm noodling. I, I think that's a really good strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just something that, you know, um, I, I don't know if you ever thought about it, but, mm-hmm. it's just, you know, something and throw a wrench in there. <laughs> no, I like it. No, I, but I, you know, I was looking at it just from the seller finance side, not thinking mm-hmm. these options. So I'm, yeah. I'm definitely going to explore that a little further because you're right. You get, you get a little bit more runway in mm-hmm. that strategy than you do with the seller finance right strategy i like both the only thing i would say is with the seller finance the difference is okay, it depends on how you have it in the contract right when uh joey do they have a prepayment penalty for you uh, if they refinance you out anytime in the near future uh it all depends on how you structure it so you could or you don't have to yeah you know, it's yeah it's all negotiable everything really is negotiable and oh just to clarify for any of the audience that doesn't know what i'm explaining so a prepayment penalty is certain loans if you don't like if you have if you don't have the loan for long enough you may be charged like one percent two percent three percent of what the entire loan is for if you sell off the property so the reason i asked that from joey is because like he's he did that less about less than a year ago or so and if these people who bought his property uh you know, seller finance wanted to, they could refinance and then basically pay, pay off Joey. If he had some prepayment penalty, then, you know, he could get, you know, a percentage back. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. So, so the key thing is that their credit isn't great. So the only way really they would be able to do that is if they actually sold the prop, you know, let's say they, they needed to move or something like that and they sold the property, then it, it works that way. But yes, like for our commercial, uh, we have a commercial loan for our Belleville property yes. and there's a prepayment penalty on that. So we refinance uh, and it's actually a kind of like a reverse scale, if you will. I think it goes from like 4%, 3 and 2 as the years go on. My question to you right now is if you were going to get started today, would you give as a piece of advice to yourself? Well, we all know that finding the deal is the most important thing. Being able to find deals and negotiate good deals off of the sellers that you do find and talk to. So for new people, I would honestly recommend, especially new new people who are beginning that don't necessarily have a lot of cash, to go find some deals and throw them to a wholesaler and bird dog them. Like basically get a finder's fee for that deal. And then they can JV or junior, you know, joint venture with that wholesaler if they want to start you know, looking at the ropes and seeing how to do it. Um, I think that starting off with a conventional loan and landlording and things like that, sure, that's one way to start, but it does require cash up front. So I think that a lot of new investors really ought to be looking at bird dogging and wholesaling as a way to start because then they're able to generate some fast money, relatively fast when you really look at it and really get a lot of experience finding deals and negotiating deals. Yeah, that's definitely. Is there any good podcasts or audiobooks or books in general that you would recommend to the audience? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure everybody that comes on this on your show recommends Bigger Pockets, but it really is an awesome forum, an awesome place to start. I mean, I remember when I first started acquiring more properties, I started listening to Bigger Pockets and then I joined the local RIA groups. I think, you know, your local real estate investment associations or local real estate meetups, you just you just meet a ton of people that just have awesome strategies, great ideas, are super successful, you know, they own 100 units and you, yeah. you never would know because they're so humble and always super super willing to share advice. So I would say, you know, bigger pockets, local real estate investment clubs. And then when it comes to the book, I mean, there's some really good books out there. Um, There's a really good book about landlording and I will get you the name in the show notes, but it's this guy out in Kentucky who basically self-managed 50 units and 
a bunch of his processes in it. So I will definitely get you that that name and the author. But it's like basically the real estate investor's guide to landlording, I believe is the title. And but I love also when it comes to mindset and really getting into the right frame of mind, The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. I think that's a really awesome book. And I'm sure a lot of people have mentioned that one on your show too, but they're just it's just that powerful. Glad you actually brought up mindset. I talk to people pretty much daily. I have new people reach out to me almost daily. They ask me how to do certain things. And, you know, I like it because most of the people don't say, oh, I can't do that. You know, it's like all the mindsets more, how can I do it? As real estate investors, whether people realize it or not, it, we're about creating deals. We have to take something that doesn't look like a deal and make it into a deal. It's not the other way around. A lot of people, they say, oh, I'm just going to go look on the MLS and go find a <laughs> property and that's how I'm going to start. Well, that's probably the worst place to start because you're paying retail price. A lot of people are looking at the same data that you're looking at, but mm -hmm. to really do it good is to go in and be, create a deal where most people think there isn't one. And yeah. I think, and that takes a, totally different mindset than just picking it off the shelf or the MLS. Exactly. Yeah, that, that like, makes a lot of sense. like for example, we have a deal that we're uh, wholesaling right now that originally was going to be a subject to, <laughs> but then we found a lot of issues with it being a subject to since it was a 203k. As we, you know, peeled the onion per se, we realized there was more opportunity that it would make sense as a subject to, I'm sorry, as a, uh, Wholesale. Yeah, because mm -hmm. so. there's people out there that to them that's a great deal because they've got the right they've got the right team in place they've got the right whatever volume discounts for materials and things of that nature so yeah it's just being able to have multiple exit strategies I always think that's really fun to to figure out with other investors you know when I have a deal and I'm trying to figure out okay how do I make this the most profitable or what are my different exit strategies those are always really fun conversations to have and bounce ideas off with other investors for sure. Uh, I remember me, Joey, and one of our other partners, Mark, were talking about this one deal. We were making it so complicated with the subject too. And then I just had to sit back for a second. I'm like, can't we just wholesale this? And then, <laughs> and then they're both like, how? And I'm like, oh, you just do this. <laughs> and the light bulb hit like, oh yeah, we're making this more complicated than it really needs to be. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, that light bulb just went in my head, went on. I was like, "Oh wait, you're right." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we we were we were trying to do so many things with this subject too. You know, if we did this, because the the guy really he was in the middle of the construction. I, I don't know how familiar you are with a, a 203k loan. So the seller, he was he's in the middle of construction. His contractor basically left him his contractor has basically taken 85 percent of the money but did 40 percent of the work there's only a, a small amount left on the loan and he's got you know the project hasn't moved in uh, how long like six months yeah, a like, year yeah. who knows you know so that house has been sitting vacant for a long long time and the guy's just been paying the mortgage and that's it so he he had no he, he didn't know how to get out, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad we were kind of able to come in and just help him out at least. and make some money. <laughs> because I mean, we're providing solutions, you know, to people yeah. that, you know, maybe the traditional path of putting it up on the MLS just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. For yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Yeah. So Kim, that just brings me to another question I had for you. As a woman, I'm sure as a woman in real estate, it's a little bit more difficult because, you know, this is technically considered a boys club or whatever. What have you done differently or to show that you mean business and to basically demand respect? I think showing up and over and over and over again and building some good rapport with contractors as part of building the team. You know, sure, there's I've it's taken a while to find people that that I can trust, that they can trust me. And once that trust, there's that connection of trust and building that rapport, then things get a lot easier. But I'm telling you, the, one of the things that is a challenge is if I need to find a new contractor, mm -hmm. I just know that it's gonna take 
probably five different people that I'm going to have to vet out and one will do a great job and, and will kind of make the cut. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because we do think that there's preconceived notions. I mean, is, but just being honest, you know, probably preconceived <laughs> notions. I'm out of town on top of that. So there are some hurdles that I have to overcome. But the nice thing is, is that through, you know, some referrals, because I'm starting to make more connections in that area, mm -hmm. being there 15 years, I can get some good referrals. That always helps. And I have some really good contractors in each trade that I'm able to call. But it, it definitely was a process building that up over the last 15 years, for sure. You know, it's a great question and one that is, you know, I'm happy to answer because there are different challenges out there. What are other challenges that you think you saw getting started in real estate and how did you overcome them? Sure. So again, the way that I started is I picked a property off the shelf and I bought it and you know, never knowing I was going to be a landlord. So I think my biggest challenge was really honing in my negotiation skills and really starting to do better, a better job at evaluating properties and being able to get better deals. So I think that once I learned that, and you know, you get that through practice, through real estate investment clubs, bouncing off ideas from people. And so, but that was one of my bigger challenges when I first started. And I think that a lot of other investors that are new will face the same thing. That's why I really say, try to bird dog a couple deals, wholesale a couple deals, because that's gonna give you way more training than just picking a property off the MLS and starting. Exactly. At a wholesale, because you got to think you, you're getting a deeply discounted property and it has to be discounted enough that another investor wants to buy it off of you. Mm -hmm. so it's definitely a skill set to learn. Yeah. And still be able to make money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then all of the different nuances that happen with each and every deal because they're never one never looks the same as the other for sure oh, they're always different there's always some kind of difference in every single deal every single yeah. one i really don't have any other questions uh joey do you have any no uh the only the only thing um want to ask you kimberly is um Basically, how can our listeners get in touch with you if they want to learn more about, you know, how, how to become a landlord and things like that and, you know, learn your process as well? Uh, I guess your social media, are you on Facebook, uh, Instagram, not sure, LinkedIn or whatever other social media you're on? Listeners can go to my website, which is uh, www.thew2landlord.com. And there's a lot of different ways that they can reach out to me. Um, I'm pulling together some small group coaching if people want to get into a group with more accountability. But then also, too, if you just want to join my Facebook group, I've um, opened up a Facebook group called uh, the W2 Landlords. So which is pretty fun, you know, where every every day I post a different post to get people to engage, to share their deals, to get advice on their deals. And the group can help answer it. It's not just me answering it. It's just more of a community of people that that want to network and connect and share deals and post deals and you know just talk about even life if they want to. <laughs> so those are two ways that they can get in touch with me. All right, you know, Kimberly, it's been a pleasure. Just one final thing for the show. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe. You know, any feedback for the show, fully appreciate it. Just want to thank you again, Kimberly, and um, take care, everybody.